Back in November, the House of Representatives passed the $1.9 trillion Build Back Better Act. Now, it's been stalled in the Senate for a while, but there are now some encouraging signs that the climate portion of it will make its way through in one form or another. So I'm going to talk to a bioscience company C CEO, a company's name is Yield10, and uh, Dr. Oliver Peoples is going to explain some of the implications for Build Back Better for sustainable aviation fuel and other kinds of uh, biofuel initiatives. So welcome to the interview, Oliver. Well, well, it's really nice to be you and happy new year, happy new year, everyone. Well, thank you for being here. Now, can you explain uh, briefly uh, how Build Back Better, uh, what, the, what are the implications for, for biofuels and so on? Yeah, so when you look at what's really happening in the transportation sector, I think there's really uh, a couple of things that are going on. One is obviously the electrification. We're seeing more and more electric vehicles. I think that trend is going to continue. Eventually, they will domino, dominate the petrol, I guess, the, the gas, a gasoline segment of the market. But when you get to things like uh, trucks and, 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 and ships and trains and, uh, and airplanes, in particular the airplanes, um, where you've got the other issue of having to you know, be multinational and, and, and how you deal with some of these climate issues, um, certainly there's a demand for aviation biofuel. Uh, and then because of the low carbon fuel standards, uh, particularly in California, but also in Oregon, Washington State, Alberta, um, or shall we say uh, British Columbia, and likely to be happening also over Canada, you've got this tremendous demand for feedstocks, low carbon intensity feedstocks uh, for the production of these biofuels. Um, that's really a huge, a huge sort of new opportunity for, for, for agriculture. Um, it's a tremendous opportunity for aviation. Uh, and where Build Back Better comes into it is obviously a tremendous amount of support for these types of fuels and their deployment broadly uh, and their adoption, which is really important. Um, but also, and particularly as it relates to, to a company like Yield 10, where we're really, really interested in new crops that can add uh, opportunities for farmers to differentiate what they do every year. Uh, we're very excited about the cover cropping uh, potential of this because there is actually funding in there for $25 per acre for the use of cover crops on their land that would normally lie fallow throughout the winter. And I understand that you're working on a, uh, uh, a product called Cam uh, Camelina. Maybe you could explain that for us. Yeah, so I, you know, you're Canadian, so obviously you've heard of canola. And uh, as, a, as it's known, Canadian oil. And can Canadian can canola is basically a variety of rapeseed. And, you know, to get to the Latin term, it's a, it's a brassica, of all things, who knew? Um, but obviously, that's a very important oil seed crop in Canada. Um, it really was something that was developed through traditional genetic breeding, um, basically through, you know, from the 60s into the sort of early 80s before um, what they had um, developed was really the, the canola quality, uh, which had a healthier oil and it had a healthier, you know, protein meal, which is used, used primarily in, in animal feed. Um, Camelina is similar, uh, except it doesn't it doesn't have the advantage of you know, the tremendous amount of development that went on since you know since the sort of late 50s, 60s. Um, it's really a crop that's been used primarily in northern Europe. Um, it has some really interesting and exciting attributes. Um, it does make uh, a good oil. It makes a very healthy oil actually. Um, but it's more like um, in terms of stage development, it's it's actually quite far behind. And so, you know, you can look at that and say, well, it's got a long way to go to be competitive. So what else does it have? And, and, and it has a couple of things going for it that we think are really exciting. The first is it's got a very fast growth cycle. So it needs fewer frost-free days. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to visit Saskatoon in January. And believe me, fewer frost-free days is a good thing. Um, so, you know, I would say that opens up, obviously, the use of this crop as a rotation crop in, in, in the Pacific Northwest, up into Canada, Saskatchewan, Alberta. Uh, the other area where it's really exciting is essentially is a cover crop because its fast growth cycle allows you to plant it uh, in, in the soybean, corn soybean belt, where you've harvested your corn or soybeans, uh, and then to overwinter it. So this crop will actually come up out of the ground and it will essentially overwinter. Uh, and it comes up very quickly in the spring, and you can actually harvest the crop before you plant the next year's uh, soybean. Um, now, there's been efforts in Canada to do this with what is known as winter rapeseed, which is the sort of you know the, the non-food quality uh, canola. 
but it was never very successful because of course winter rapeseed hasn't been able to survive there. So we've been doing winter camelina varieties up in uh, Canada for a number of years. And we think that's just a tremendous opportunity. Now, how does camelina potentially fit into a biofuel scenario? So like, uh, like some of the other oil seeds, it produces, you know, 40% of the seed weight is oil. And that oil can be recovered by just cold pressing or, or typical extraction. Uh, and then it can be clean, you know, cleaned up and fed into uh, any kind of uh, essentially renewable diesel or renewable aviation fuel uh, infrastructure that's just already in place. And so it's sort of a drop in alternative to canola oil or soybean oil. Um, and it has the advantage in that because it requires less inputs, um, it has the advantage of having a, what they call a better carbon intensity index. And carbon intensity index, of course, is the key economic driver of value for the use of the renewables in blends with regular diesel fuel and aviation fuel. Now, when you say a smaller carbon or you know fewer inputs, smaller carbon footprint, I think are you thinking about uh, nitrogen, for example, it, it, less tilling and and work in the field, those sorts of things. Yeah, those sorts of things, and it's a combination of things. It, it basically it doesn't require as much water. Uh, it seems to be able to tolerate you know less optimum soil conditions. Uh, it doesn't seem to need as much fertilizer, that type of thing. And so when you do the analysis around all of that, you sort of reach the, you know, you can basically define that this has a lower carbon intensity index than soybean and canola. And that of course makes it favorable in that particular market space. Oliver, how, uh, give me a sense of the, the time here until camelina becomes a, a commercially viable crop for biofuels. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's something that started off early, I would say, basically back in the mid 2000s. And of course, for the whole biodiesel activity, which um, as, as the industry sort of moved away from that and oil and gas became so cheap and plentiful, uh, that essentially, you know, you know, basically the market kind of dried up. Uh, so although some biodiesel players did survive that sort of um, situation, um, it's really the new regulations, and it's not just the government. And I think this is an important uh, thing for your for your your listeners to, to hear. It's actually major investment firms, whether that's Bank of America, BlackRock, Fidelity, uh, all at Putnam. These major investment firms are all being uh, tasked with um, identifying low carbon alternatives and, and, and investing in businesses that are uh, improving climate uh, versus the traditional uh, oil and gas companies. So are we talking about maybe two to five years, five to 10 years? What's your best guess? Yeah, so we're growing winter camelina in Saskatchewan uh, this winter, uh, a relatively small scale, you know, several acres or hectares. And obviously the goal would be to start scaling that up. And, and the way we view it kind of from our starting point is um, what we call early commercial thousands of acres, you know, sort of low thousands of acres. And then commercial when you get to sort of, you know, 50,000, 500,000 acres. And once you get to that scale, again, with some of the technologies that will be necessary to go beyond that first 50 to 100,000 hectares, uh, really herbicide disease tolerance, then of course it really becomes a matter of how does it fit into the overall ag cycle? What's the benefits to the growers? Uh, you know, what's the revenue to them versus the other crops they can grow? Uh, but ultimately, as a cover crop, it could certainly command, you know, 15, 20 million hectares in North America. Oliver, thank you very much for this. Good luck with your uh, with your new crop, and uh, thank you very much for your insights. Well, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you. Thank you.